A little home-cooked philosophy from the hot tub curmudgeon on this Valentine's Day of 2018. Our last day in paradise, San Diego. We rode bikes down the beach and up the bay and turned in the bikes and rode the bus back to the apartment. And we will pack now to return to the rain. I'm going to talk about relationships, so maybe Valentine's Day is appropriate. This is Nathan G's theory of personality. Now, if you missed it from a prior video, G is a uh, Urdu and Hindu honorific, which I've uh, taken upon myself. This theory of personality developed as a consequence of a course I was taking from Landmark Education. Every Friday night, we signed a promise that our home was impeccable, our workplace was impeccable, and our automobile was impeccable. There were promises also that we had been obeying laws, including traffic laws, and we've been treating people fairly and with integrity. But this requirement that I keep my spaces with impeccability really stuck in my craw. For the first couple of weeks, I kind of enjoyed cleaning and straightening and seeing the result. But to maintain that over a length of time is not in my nature. Currently at home, my wife has dedicated a room in the house to Nathan, and it looks like a bomb went off in there. The rest of the house is impeccable and artfully decorated. So it stuck in my craw that I had to swear that I was keeping my spaces impeccable. And as you could predict from a person who learned from a dominating father that, quote, he doesn't mean no, he just means leave no trace that you did. As you could predict from such a person, I began to fudge on the promises of impeccability. The fudging took the form of telling myself, it's impeccable by my standards. Now, about the time I began this fudging, my wife, at the time, uh, there's been so many, my wife shared with me that she noticed that she was making the beds to satisfy the judgments of a mother who lived 600 miles away and visited maybe every two years. Imagine that, doing housework to meet the judgments of a ghost presence. When she was a child, if her mother didn't like the way the child made the bed, her mother would tear it up and redo it. Same with sewing. If her mother didn't like the child's work, she'd tear it open and redo it. Now, from my fudging and from her bed-making story, I saw something about how we live and develop. So I want you to take a look at this drawing. These arrows represent the judgments and expectations of other people. There's no you in there, or if there is, it's very small and insignificant. You are made up of, you consist of the judgments and demands, expectations of other people. Now, when someone criticizes or insults you, you are destroyed. When they compliment you or praise you, you are made. You keep house for other people. Okay, now this is a contingent and painful way to live. So just as soon as we can, we move to a way of being that can deflect or disregard judgments and expectations. That's my next illustration. Hold on a second here. We uh, develop a hard little shell that can deflect. All right, so I gotta find this here. So, there we have it, the hard little shell that can deflect and disregard the demands and expectations of other people. You, now, you is represented by that little round thing, the hard little shell. My observation is that we develop that shell by developing competencies and acquiring valuable things. I remember a time when my legal ability was just about to be revealed as incompetent, but some little gremlin inside me 
propped me back up and reassured me that I was a successful family man, a successful father. That particular competency deflected the negative judgment about my lawyering skills. That's pretty funny. So now, in this stage, we keep house and we present ourselves to others by our own standards. It's impeccable by my standards. When someone insults us, it means nothing to us. When someone praises us, we shrug it off because no one is a better judge than ourselves. Now, there's a third stage of development, and I represent that with these arrows and these little dots. Oops, wait a minute here. So now, these little dots represent you, and the arrows are the demands and expectations of other people. And your sense of self now includes other people. It, your sense of self includes the demands and expectations of other people. So I keep house to serve others, not to meet their judgments and expectations. And should I see that keeping house for them does not serve them, but weakens them, then I don't keep house. It is better that their friends should see the pigsty they choose to live in, and then they will begin that developmental process of trying to graduate away from the pain of the judgments of others. In this third sense of self, when I am insulted and the thought occurs, well, the thought will occur to me then, what kind of day are you having that that came out of your mouth? Now notice that when there's someone in your life that you really, really love and you're very confident in their love, that is where you come from. What kind of day are you having that that came out of your mouth? But in this third stage I'm talking about, that's pretty much your approach to everybody and everything. And when I am praised, I notice that the person is actually praising values that the person aspires to in themselves. I think very few people reach this place of personality development. I don't know what motivates the development. I don't what motivates the movement from the second to the third. Now, what motivates us from the set first to the second stage is pain. It's the avoiding of judgment and expectation. The mechanism of moving from the first to the second stage is the acquiring of skills and things. The mechanism of moving from the second to the third stage is the releasing, the unattaching of one's attachment to being defined by skills and possessions. Now, my guess about the sourcing of this third stage is that a person begins to sense that their identity is somewhat of an illusion. Here's my favorite quote from George Bernard Shaw. This is the true joy in life, the being used for a purpose, recognized by yourself as a mighty one, the being thoroughly worn out before you are thrown on the scrap heap, the being a force of nature instead of a feverish, selfish little clod of ailments and grievances complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. The third stage begins to awaken when one awakens to that true joy in life, the being used for a mighty purpose. The Sufi master Rumi said many things that create the imagery that we float in a sea of love, that we have always been loved and will always be loved. The third stage awakens when we apprehend that we can let go of all those defenses and our hard little shell because we are loved beyond imagination. And if we are loved beyond imagination, everyone else is also. And this new sense of self is one of unity with the sea of love. The sense of self then includes the judgments and expectations of others without being defined by them. These judgments and expectations of others are to be served to the extent they can be served 
within the sea of love. Another of my favorite quotes by von Durkheim, only to the extent that one exposes oneself over and over again to annihilation can that which is indestructible arise within. In this lies the dignity of daring. Thus, the aim of spiritual practice is not to develop an attitude which allows one to acquire a state of harmony and peace wherein nothing can ever trouble. Notice that von Durkheim seems to refer there to that second stage, developing the hard little shell of harmony and peace wherein nothing can ever trouble. Now to go back to his quote, on the contrary, practice should teach to let oneself be assaulted, perturbed, moved, insulted, broken, and battered. That is to say, it should enable daring to let go of the futile hankering after harmony, relief from pain, and the hankering for a comfortable life. Instead, that we might discover in doing battle with the forces that oppose that which awaits us beyond the world of opposites. So von Durkheim proposes that the third stage comes from discovering that within you that is indestructible. Now to wrap all this up, to summarize, if you need a summarization, we start out defined by the demands and expectations of others. That's a painful, contingent way to live, so we develop a sense of self that deflects the demands and expectations of others, and we do that by acquiring skills and things. Some of us strive to move to a third stage that includes others and their judgments and demands without being defined by them. This is a very difficult place to get to unless some miracle of grace gives it to you. Sometimes a person will walk away from a rollover in their car and every value and perspective is changed in an instant. Maybe they discover something in them that is indestructible. Now, here's a little story about a miracle of grace that gave me a small taste of the third stage. My wife and I had spoken frequently of a dream to walk to the five villages of the Cinque Terre in Italy. One day at work, she calls with, quote, great news, close quote, that she's going with her sorority sisters to visit the Cinque Terre. That was a Monday morning, and I spent until Thursday totally furious. I would never agree to such a trip, even if a friend paid for it without asking her first. In fact, I can't think of anyone I'd want to do it with other than her. Why the hell are we married? Rant, 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 rant. Thursday morning, it's like the sea of love flicked me on the back of the head, and in about one-eighth of a second, the following happened to me. I saw that my old age is handled. If I'm widowed, I have five children who love me and 11 grandchildren. I saw that her old age is not as handled. She has three sisters who love her very much, but they're older than she is, and her best friends are older than she is. In that one-eighth of a second, I realized that what I want for the woman I love is that in her old age, if I'm not there, that she have many friends, such as her old sorority pals. In one-eighth of a second, I went from angry resentment and wanting to be alone to strongly desiring the very thing I had been resenting. So maybe we get to the third stage by such miracles of grace. It is my wish that you have a really big one.